All right, kiddos, welcome to the Chapter 5, Part 2 uh, lecture. This is covering pages 122 to 132 of Chapter 5. This is all about population ecology. So let me go ahead and refer to your guided learning questions. The first one asks for you to look at page 124. There's figure 5.10. I'm going to be uh, showing you a different version of that on the second slide. But first, I wanted to remind you what a species is, uh, which we discussed in, in a previous lecture. That is a set of individuals that can mate and produce fertile offspring. Remember, hybridization, not the same thing. Uh, about 1.8 million species have been identified. It is good to know that insects make up most of the known species. I believe that's something that will come up in one of your cartoon guide quizzes. Perhaps 10 to 14 million species out there are not yet identified, so if you are someone who would like to name things after yourself, or maybe if you discover something that's stinky or uh, tastes bad and name it after somebody you don't like, this is definitely uh, a field for you. There's lots and lots out there that we have yet to identify. All right, so your first question says, compare and contrast individual organisms, populations, communities, ecosystems in the biosphere. Infer how biomes and species fit in with these classifications. All right, individuals make up a population, and a population is a subset of a species, which we just discussed, that live in a particular area that may or not met, blah, that may or may not have contact with other populations of that species. Populations of different organisms, uh, so of different species, that live in the same area or a community. Thus, population ecology is how individuals of the same species in one group interact with each other, while community ecology is how different populations interact with each other. For example, predator-prey relationships. An ecosystem is the community plus abiotic factors like light and water uh, plus organism interactions. Ecosystem ecology is the study of patterns within the ecosystem usually energy or nutrient flow. And remember, nutrient flow is things like the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. A biome is the natural grouping of ecosystems along a longitude that has similar temperature and precipitation patterns. So uh, if you are talking about an ecosystem that has that is a boreal forest in one area, you're going to find another ecosystem of the boreal forest type along the same longitude. Uh, because they have similar temperatures and precipitation. So do remember, why are we even talking about this? Because populations do have a genetic diversity, variations in individuals of a population, because we've discussed before, when you separate two populations for long periods of time, rather at, whether in an allopatric or a sympatric fashion, you could end up with two new species. So that idea that species don't travel together in one giant group is how we end up with speciation. So that's where this all becomes important. So please understand uh, individual organisms of the same species make up a population. Populations of different species living together in a defined area as a community. When you add in the non-living and the interactions between the community members, that is the ecosystem. And then the biosphere is parts of Earth that contain all the ecosystems, so the parts of Earth that support life. All right. Uh, contrast in organisms, habitat, and its niche. So uh, a niche is a species functional role in its ecosystem, it includes anything affecting a species survival and reproduction. So ranges of tolerance, I'm going to talk about that here in a minute, a little bit more, type of resources used, interactions with living and non-living components, and the role plays the role it plays in the flow of energy and matter cycling. Uh, if that doesn't make a lick of sense to you when we start talking about things like decomposers um, and uh, consumers that every time you eat something or break something down you send carbon and nitrogen and water to different places of the ecosystem. So here is a really good way to contrast a habitat and a niche. Habitat is the location location of the species, it's their home. This can be very tiny, talking a drop of water, or very large like I believe one Florida panther needs five square miles to support it, or anywhere in between. 
Um, and then a niche is its job. How does it use resources and what is its functional role within a community? Is it a producer? Is it a consumer? Is it a keystone species, which you don't know what it is that is yet? Um, how does it interact with the abiotic and biotic habitat elements? And the reason this says abiotic versus biotic habitat elements is to remind you that abiotic are the non-living things and then biotic are the living or once living things in, in, in a habitat. All right, your next question. What is an epiphyte? An epiphyte is a plant that uses another plant for physical support, obtaining water from the air and nutrients from organic debris that collect among their leaves. Here are four examples of an epiphyte. Uh, bottom left-hand corner is the ghost orchid. This is endemic to Florida, actually to Florida swamps. They are very rare. They bloom very briefly and uh, they are so uh, endangered that people will actually go into the uh, swamp when they have their very brief blooming time so they can find them and then steal them. Uh, up here is a bromeliad. Down here this is more commonly called an air plant. And then upper right hand corner that is Spanish moss. That is also, it is actually a plant, an epiphyte. Okay, next question says, relate scale and preference to habitat selection. This is where I'm gonna loop this slide in. Uh, scale is usually depends on size or the needs of organisms. Think about what a soil might needs versus a panther in terms of uh, resources. And then preference. Organisms can have uh, very few or many specific needs for survival. For example, cockroaches can live in lots of places where giant pandas have a very specific set of survival conditions, so you only find them in certain areas. And the circumstances you can regard as, another word for that is tolerance. Here you see uh, a tolerance range for this type of fish. You can see it's largely based on temperature and that sweet spot, the place where you find most of them, is that optimum range of temperature for it. That is its range of tolerance. The places where you do not find them are zones of intolerance. They cannot survive there. For example, if you bring an emperor penguin to the state of Florida, they're going to die because you've moved them out of their zone of tolerance. And that all plays into habitat selection. All right, next part here is to contrast a special species against a general species. So let's go ahead and talk about these things. General species, like a cockroach, large niche. So in other words, they can eat and interact with lots of different things, tolerate a wide range, wide range of environmental variations. They do better during changing environmental conditions. These are the guys that when changes occur, they're in great shape. Specialists, narrow niches like an endemic species, where you only find them in one very specific set of conditions in one area. These guys are more likely to become endangered because obviously if their little special area goes away, they go away as, as well. And they do under they do better, even better than the generalists, under consistent environmental conditions because they are so uh, exquisitely adapted to that uh, consistent environmental condition that they can outcompete anything else that comes their way. Let's see if there's anything else I need to tell you. Yeah, specialists thrive in staple conditions, generalists thrive in changing conditions. All right, we're going to stay on the slide for the next set of questions because some of these things should hopefully be common sense. Um, what is a population? Relate the term population to the concept of a species. A population is individual of the same species inhabiting a particular area. So basically, again, a population is a subset of a species. Um, what are the six population attributes cited by the text that helps ecologists predict the future dynamics of a population, whether it stays stable in size, grows, or shrinks? So here they are listed. Population size, population density, population distribution, sex ratio, age structure, and birth slash death rates. So I'm going to stay here and kind of talk about um, uh, a couple of these terms in the next question, I believe. Yes. All right. So uh, population size is just how many 
individuals there are in a certain population. And remember that nobody's sitting around counting each individual one. That's where you use things like the mark recapture technique, which we have done, or if you're going to be uh, viewing this in another year, we'll be doing in class at some point. There's also something called a quadrat study and a transect study, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Um, and a couple of other methods which we'll discuss in class. Population density, that is how many individuals there are per unit area. Now, how dense something is can be dependent upon several things. It can be that you have overpopulation going on. It can also be that that's just how the organism likes to live. Look at an ant, for example. High population density within their ant hill. Then there are other organisms like a tiger, uh, they live individually unless they come together for the purposes of mating. Polar bears are the same way. Uh, male and female polar bears only come together when they mate. Male polar bear leaves, the female raises the cubs, and then they break off and live individual lives. All right, let's see. In terms of size, what are four things that can happen to a population over time? Three of them should be obvious. You can increase, you can decrease, you can stay the same. But there is a fourth one that we will discuss a little bit later as well, it is a cyclical change. It's where you can have an increase and a decrease that is well documented and happens during specific times of the, uh, of the year, of decades, depending on the time unit. A good example of that is there is a bug called the cicada. It is this little flying bug, probably as big as your thumb, that uh, I think there's a seven year and an 11 year and a 18 year variety, the, the couple different varieties of them where they uh, come out of holes in the ground, they form these giant swarms, they mate, they lay their eggs, they die. The eggs form larvae that stay in stasis for however long it is that they do, seven to 18 years, every species has their own time, at which point they uh, develop and do the same cycle over again very well documented cyclical nature to their population size. All right, um, when we do talk about population size and population density, mapping these things allows us to know the state of a species. Are they abundant? Are they going endangered? Are they extinct? Because again, we're talking about ecosystems here, and you can only lose so many species in an ecosystem before the whole thing collapses. So let's go ahead and talk about the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon was a bird native to North America. You can see there in the lower right hand corner. It is a really large bird with a ruby red eye. Um, that is what's called a steady skin. That's just the outer feathers of the bird. This one was stuffed and mounted in such a way so it resembled uh, the original species. That drawing there on the left is an example of a single flock. They, how many were there? Billions. Um, there were times that it would take days for a flock, hours to days for a flock to go by. Some were estimated to be in excess of two billion with a B birds, and that's just one flock. So they were everywhere. They were the uh, most abundant bird in North America. What happened to the population in 1912? That is when the last bird, whose name was, I believe, Martha, died in captivity, a female. Uh, how did this happen? Because they were so abundant, because they were large enough to eat, because they had all sorts of feathers that could be used to stuff pillows and blankets and whatnot, you would set up a, a system like this, like this uh, netting system that you see. And you take, uh, this is where stool pigeon came from, you take one bird, break its legs, tie it to a stool, sew its eyes shut, uh, you, or maybe even break a wing instead of the leg, so it would sit there, flop around, and make it sound of distress. This particular type of bird would uh, flock when another organism was in distress. This works really well when you're being attacked by a predator because if you're overcome by thousands and thousands of birds, a predator does not know how to deal with prey that suddenly turns on it. So they kind of short circuit out and they leave. Not so great when you have a human who set up this entire net system. You could catch them by the thousands and then even just beat them to death. You didn't have to waste the money on bullets to kill them. And we were so good at doing this, again, by 1912, we'd taken a bird that measured in the billions, probably as many people as there are on this planet right now, and we wiped them out completely um, in the space of a hundred some odd years when commercial hunting became a thing. So I guess go us. So uh, next 
thing is what are the pros of a high population density and the cons. Uh, here you see two pictures of organisms, one with a high population density. Here you have penguins, and then to the left you have a tiger. Um, penguins usually form colonies. They form especially thick colonies when they're mating. Tigers, again, are solitary species that come together only to mate, and then they go down their own way. Some pros to having a, a high population density. A lot easier for you to find mates. Uh, the, I don't know that this is in your book, but you got to think it defends you against predators. It's the outer organisms that take the brunt of the attack. Uh, when fish are threatened, they oftentimes form these very tight balls, and um, it's only the outer fish that end up getting eaten. Um, now, what are the cons? You quickly use up resources like food and space, and you do run out of mates if you kind of are the odd organism out. This can lead to intraspecies conflict. You need to understand the difference between these prefixes. Intra means within, inter means between. So uh, as an example, when we have dodgeball or any sort of little sporting event at school, that is intramurals. That is sports happening within an organization. When our football team plays the football team of another school, that is intramurals. That is a sporting event that takes place between schools. So same deal here. Uh, Intra-specific uh, conflict is within the species. You have two organisms of the same sort fighting over the same thing. Inter-specific would be something, again, like a predator-prey situation. All right, and um, sorry, I lost my place. When you have more organisms of one sort in an area and they have a predator, more predators are going to show up because they're going to think it's like buffet on a cruise ship. You know, I'm ready to go. The, the likelihood you're actually going to eat, get something to eat is pretty high because there's a lot of them there. And then you also have an increase in the transmission to disease. Uh, you should know this from personal experience. When you're home, you probably do not get sick very often. The minute you come to school is when you start getting colds and coughs and whatnot because you're crammed into a building with 2,000 plus other people, some of whom come to school sick. So uh, the more of a population you have in an area, the more likely you are to have a transmission of disease. All right, uh, the next thing that was on our list is uh, how organisms arrange themselves in space. Three types, you have random, which is no particular pattern. This is usually found in plants with haphazard dispersal methods like dandelions. You know this, uh, dandelions form those seeds with the little parachutes on them. You've probably blown on one at one point, whoo, the seeds go away. They disperse themselves randomly. Um, a uniform population is a very ordered pattern where individuals are evenly spaced. This is usually linked to organisms that hold territories, like desert plants are exactly as far apart as their roots can spread, so there's no competition for the water that falls every so often. And then birds and nesting colonies. If you measure the length of a bird's nest, or excuse me, a bird's neck and bill, and how far it is from the next nest, that is exactly the space that is in between the nests because they are close enough together that they can use the resources, but they are far enough away that they cannot steal either nesting material or kill the chicks of the bird that is next to them. And then there's also clumped. This is the most common pattern. It is closely grouped individuals that rely on the same resource. Think like deer or people. So here are some examples of population distribution. Uh, down here in the lower right-hand corner, dandelions. Uh, upper right-hand corner, those are birds in a nesting colony. Uh, upper left-hand corner, those are zebras in a clump. And you can argue, uh, in some cases, trees in a forest could be clumped here in the lower left-hand corner, or they also could be considered random. It just really depends. Please remember, when we give you these classifications of organisms all throughout uh, this unit, not every organism fits into these nice, neat little boxes. It is important that whenever we talk about a term, you remember a classic example for that particular term. Um, don't pick one that's eh, kind of yeah, kind of no, because that's not what they're looking for in the national exam. So it is up to you that any time we mention a particular thing, a particular classification, immediately remember an organism that fits that particular box perfectly. All right, the next thing that was on your list was um, sex ratios. Um, hmm, I feel like I'm skipping something. One second. Yes, that's right. All right, so what is the most common sex ratio of monogamous species? That is usually 
um, one boy for every girl. Now, um, as we continue with this, it's not really important for the national exam, but monogamy is not exactly a thing because remember you want your particular genetic material to survive and so often oftentimes that means to make sure that your uh, particular uh, brood uh, or litter or whatever has genetic material from a multitude of partners so uh, females and males will often even if it looks like they're in a monogamous partnership where you have a female laying eggs or giving birth to uh, little little critters and the male is a part of raising them oftentimes the male has spread his genetic material to other females or the female has accepted genetic material from other males uh, you see this a lot in ducks ducks uh, if you actually take the D, uh, do a paternity test for lack of a better term on ducks you will find that a lot of their uh, little little chicks or goslings that are in there come from multiple fathers. Uh, you commonly see this in, in house cats. That is why uh, females will oftentimes have litters that have wildly different uh, fur patterns. It's because they have multiple fathers were involved. So anyway, what you see here is when we talk about monogamy, that's more about rearing the young than it is necessarily who begat who. So there on the left-hand side, you see a monogamous pair of cardinals. Uh, males are always red, females are that um, kind of rusty color with a bright orange bill and a little specklings of red here and there. And then uh, lower right hand corner. Uh, this was not necessarily in your book, but how do you think the ratio might be different for organisms that have more than one seasonal partner? Example, male deer or the harem, or here um, a male lion with his pride. Um, it probably skews, the population probably skews more towards females, uh, although sometimes you still see that 50 50 ratio because you will have herds of young males that travel around together until they are strong enough and um, you know have have the um, skills to go ahead and ch challenge an established male for his his particular pride or herd all right um, let's see if there's anything else that I skipped on that list okay age structure uh, age structure diagrams are something that we are going to be, let me go back just to kind of get you to focus on what it is that I'm saying. All right, uh, one of the, the six things that I talked about, population attributes that help ecologists predict the future dynamics of a population, one is age structure diagrams. If you took AP Human Geo, you've seen these before. We're not going to go over those right now. We're going to save that for human populations. Just be aware that it is a um, set of two bar graphs that are kind of stood up on one end and smushed together that allow you to kind of see how uh, male and female subsets of the population based on age are doing and that allows you to predict what's going to happen to that population a little bit later on. But again, don't worry about that right now. Birth and death rates. There is something called a crude birth rate and a crude death rate that is births and deaths per 1,000 individuals. So just be aware of what that is. I think, yeah, that was question 14. What is the definition of a crude birth or death rate? That's births or deaths in a population per 1,000 individuals over a given time period. I am going to teach you a little bit of math involved with that. All right, so back to this, survivorship curves. Um, what is the purpose of the survivorship curve? Uh, you may want to turn in your book to figure 5.14. Uh, uh, they show how uh, the likelihood of death can vary with age and type of organism. So you have type 1. Most deaths occur at a young age. These are usually um, our selected species like a toad. Although I haven't talked about it here, I do believe that we have talked about it already with your cartoon guide. Uh, type 3. Most deaths are at an old age. This is usually case selected species like post-industrial people or uh, rhinoceros. And then type 2 probability of death at any age. Coral, squirrels, honeybees, birds, many reptiles. Um, and you can see that there are more um, examples here of different types of survivorships. I have included a picture here of the survivorship curves. You must know that early loss, high, um, that uh, early loss survivorship is, hmm, this slide is incorrect. 
So I want for you to know this right now. Um, type 1 is the early loss, type 2 is constant loss, and type 3 is late loss. So again, on this particular slide, I have gotten them reversed. It is vital that you know, and if you look at the survivorship curve, this should be super easy. Type 1, most deaths at the young age, so that's this bottom curve here. Uh, type 2 is the straight line, you can die at any time, and then type 3 is the late loss. Please, please, please also notice what this graph is telling you. It is telling you that um, the age of the organism is on the bottom, and then the, the y-axis is the survival rate. Okay, it is not the death rate, it is the survival rate, so please know that difference. All right, um, population growth. Um, exponential growth is when you increase by a percent rather than a uh, added integer. The shape of the curve is called a J curve, and this only happens when the population is small and environmental conditions are ideal for the organism. There is only one organism that is continuing to go through exponential population growth that has not hit its carrying capacity, and that would be humans. Alright, look at figure 5.16 on page 130. It is better than any of the stuff that I have in this PowerPoint, so go ahead and get your book and open that now. Be able to identify what is represented on each axis, with the carrying capacity, where the carrying capacity is, what the exponential growth portion of the logistic growth curve represents, what environmental resistance represents, or does to the logistic growth curve. Alright, those things are in your book. Go look at it. I'm not going to go over it again. We've already done this with the um, cartoon guide. Now the carrying capacity can change. Think about it. If you lose a food source permanently, that can make the carrying capacity go down for a particular place. Because remember that this is, remember what carrying capacity is. It is the number of individuals of a certain population in a certain place. You lose a food source, the number of individuals that can live there goes down. If you lose a predator, the number of individuals can go up provided that the um, uh, the resources supports that. Now, please be aware that this one that I just showed you on the PowerPoint is the ideal situation. This one right here is basically what happens. You have a little bit of an overshoot, a little bit of dieback, a little overshoot, a little bit of dieback. Um, you're never going to have this perfect uh, line as you approach the carrying capacity. It's not going to happen. Um, so uh, we already talked, where have you heard K before? I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Um, um, I am kind of, oh no, I'm actually not skipping ahead. Uh, K. K is short for carrying capacity. That is organisms that pretty much stay at the maximum capacity for their, um, where they are. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. The letter R refers to the intrinsic rate of increase or the biotic potential of an organism. Again, I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But be again, be aware that organisms usually do an overshoot, die back. That's also called a boom and bust, so they'll kind of fluctuate along the carrying capacity line. All right. Um, what are two types of factors that influence population density? Be able to recognize examples of each. There's density dependent. Um, that becomes more of a problem for a population the more individuals you have per unit area. So examples of that are disease, predators, access to resources like food, space, and water. Density independent is like a disaster that impacts the population no matter how big or small it is. So like a forest fire, like a hurricane, like a landslide, like a flood. All right. Look at figure 5.17 on page 131. Be able to account for the differences in population numbers over time for graphs like those pictured. So um, it, this is a little bit different. Um, so go ahead and look at your book. Overshoot crash cycles are common in populations with no natural control factors like predators. Small overshoots are common in a carrying capacity graph though, as I showed you before. Cyclical and eruptive populations are documented, but we don't always understand why it is that that happens. So what might lead to a spike in an interruptive cycle, you suddenly have a brand new food source. As an example, you have a bird, let's say, that eats seeds, and then you have a farmer that like plants a whole bunch of wheat. Birds are going to go crazy. Their population is going to exponentially grow. Um, cyclical growth trends, like I talked about, that's, that's cicada. 
um, and also uh, lynx, which is a kind of cat, and snowshoe hares. Um, they form a um, cycle of where one goes up, the other goes up, and one goes down, the other goes down. What might lead to a boom-bust cycle? Um, let's say you take away a predator, uh, organ population numbers go crazy, winter comes, food goes away, they all die. All right, now, um, what is biotic potential? That is the ability to produce offspring. How does it relate to R-selected and K-selected species? R-selected species have a high biotic potential, while K-selected species have a low biotic potential. Describe more in detail how these two reproductive strategies differ from each other and in what types of conditions each strategy does best. Be able to recognize an example of each strategy. Um, specialists are often K-strategists, while generalists are often R-strategists. Specialists are also often endemic and more easily become endangered or extinct in changing conditions. You need to look in your book on table 5.4 on page 132. I really expect for you to be able to list differences there. Okay, K is an abbreviation for carrying capacity. R is an abbreviation for, um, for biotic potential, that uh, exponential growth of a population in the absence of limiting factors. R populations are often below carrying capacity because so many of their young die. Um, while K populations sit right at it, which again, it can be explained uh, by their uh, having few offspring but taking really good care of them. So um, remember that these are general classifications. Not all organisms fall into these categories. For example, redwoods live a long time but produce many small seeds. It sheds and it gives the seedlings no parental care. So let me just go down this list of stuff I've listed here. Our strategist, high body potential. They reproduce very fast. They're adapted to live in a variable climate. They produce many small, quickly maturing offspring. There are some uh, insects that can mate within days. Uh, rats, I believe, are sexually active, uh, can re reproduce within a matter of months. So early reproductive maturity. Uh, many of the offspring will die. They are opportunistic organisms. Case strategists. Adaptations allow them to maintain population values uh, around the carrying capacity, they live long lives, they reproduce later in their life, they produce few large offspring because few of them will die because they invest more parental care in those um, offspring. So again, let's look back at that carrying capacity graph. So uh, K species hover right around the carrying capacity. R species, because so many of their young die, you're always in this exponential growth uh, section. And um, uh, generalists and specialists relating them to R and K strategists. Generalists are often a characteristic of an invasive species. Um, specialists are more likely to be threatened and endangered and endemic. They are less likely to be involved in competitive exclu exclusion, which is something that's coming in another chapter. Um, that's uh, Competitive exclusion is what happens when you are competing for resources with another species. Lots of species are somewhere in the middle of all the things we're talking about here. Please remember, R and K strategists are based on reproduction. Generalists and specialist classifications are based on niche, but both are generally linked. Generalists are usually R strategists. Specialists are usually K strategists. And that brings us to the end of this section.